the relationship with siblings to tell us about God's love for us. So let's dive straight into chapter 3 of 1 John. He says, he starts off chapter 3 with, See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called the children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it does not know him. Dear friends, now we are children of God and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when Christ appears we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is. All who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. That's 1 John 3, 1 to 3. And it starts off in this translation with C. I learned an older translation when I was younger. I learned Behold. And there's a song, isn't there? Behold what manner of love the Father has. Behold. It's not just, oh, look over here when you've got a moment. It's Behold. This is really, really important. Behold in such a way that you're totally blown away. You're astonished. Your mouth is open. It's jaw-droppingly astonishing. Behold. Behold. Nothing weak or unimportant about it. Behold. This is a really important message. Behold. What great love. Great love. Again, great's not a big enough word. It's well, again, the, the, the older version says, Behold what manner of love. And it's the same word that the disciples used back in Matthew chapter 8 when Jesus stilled the storm. And do you remember what they said? What manner of man is this that even the wind and the waves, thanks lay, obey him. That's right. They were saying, the disciples back then were saying, look, this man is so more than us, so much more than us. This man is so different. It's, it's like he came from another planet. This man is so much greater. Behold what manner of love the Father has lavished onto us. Some of us remember when words are embodied in pictures, so for those of us where that's true, sometimes, this is us, sometimes we receive the God, the love of God, like a teaspoonful, and it's just kind of dripping there. It's not that kind of love. It's a love that is lavished. It's, look, it's as if... God poured his love into us and more than and he keeps pouring isn't that a good picture that's that's the lavish love of God bigger than um, a teaspoonful so much full that we are fuller than full that's the kind of love that God has lavished on us and look he not only loves us He's given us his name, that we should be called children of God. He gives us his name, and even more than that, he gives us his nature or his character. See, four lines from the bottom. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. So... God gives us his name and he gives us his nature. And sometimes things happen to us that stop us understanding that. And we think we've got to please God. And we've got to hop on a Christian treadmill and try hard to please God. 1 John's all about telling us that that's not what's happening. We can enjoy the Father's lavish love if we are enjoying the father's lavish love then we have 
confidence as his child, as a child of God, for three things. And this is the first of those things. Confidence as a child of God means that we can trust him for those details of our faith we don't yet understand. We can know that we are okay. We can know that whatever happens, all is well with our souls. We can know that. There are some things though that we don't know. We, John 3, 2 says, what we will be has not yet been made known. We don't know that. We don't know um, when the second coming will happen. We don't know what our resurrection bodies will be like. We don't know very much about heaven. But we can be perfectly assured, a deep, deep confidence that whatever happens, all is well. Here's the second one of the things we can be absolutely confident about. We can trust him for those details of our faith we don't yet understand and we can deal with the world's hostility. We do know that while we're waiting for the Lord Jesus to come again that Christians will be persecuted. The Bible says that really clearly. We know that. And John explains the reason the world does not know is that it did not know him. It's, it shouldn't take us by surprise when things are difficult. It shouldn't take us by surprise when things don't work out the way they, we would like them to. Because Jesus says, expect hard times, expect persecution. But you can be absolutely confident that when those hard times come, that all is well, no matter what. And here's the third thing. We will desire to be as much like him as we can. That's another way we can be absolutely confident that all is well because there will be within us a striving to be more Christ-like. You'll hear it in people's prayers. You'll hear it as people serve. A desire to be more like Christ. 1 John 3, 3 says, All, there's no exceptions, all who have this hope in him purify the verb means they keep on purifying it's not a once for all time thing it's a do it now and do it later and do it later and do it later again and again and again purify themselves present continuous just as he is pure so there are three things that we can know no matter what three things that give us this deep heart assurance that all is well with our souls. So, what does it look like? Let's hear what John has to say. He's going to take us full circle here. He's going to take us back to where we started two weeks ago in 1 John chapter 1. He says, no one who is born of God will continue to sin because God's seed remains in them. They cannot go on sinning because they have been born of God. Now this is not the once only, oops I shouldn't have said that or oh dear I shouldn't have done that. It's not that kind of sin. It's the mm, nobody's going to notice if I um, pocket a bit of that and take it home from work. Nobody's going to notice if I pocket a bigger bit of that and take it home from work. Nobody's going to notice if I blame someone else for the missing stores that are now, have been in my pocket and gone home for work. It's that kind of habitual, continuous, do it again and again and again and again sin when John says no one who has been born of God continues to sin. Because remember he said back in 1 John 9, 1, 9 if, we, if we sin, if we confess our sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. We wouldn't need an advocate if it were possible for us to be totally without sin, but we will want to be, we will try, because we want to please him, because it's built into the new nature he gives us. So this is how we know who the children of God are and who the children of the devil are. See, he's saying to us, there are two types of people. Anyone who does not do what is right is not God's child, 
nor is anyone who does not love their brother and sister. And so we have... <clears throat> I think we may have um, gone into the wrong kinds of slides here. So we have... two kinds of people. We have those who do right and those who sin habitually. Uh, those who are the children of God and those who are the children of the devil. Those who do right and those who don't. Those who love their fellow Christians and those who don't. See, two types of people. How do we know which we are? Well, let John tell us. We know which group we belong to. We know we've passed from death to life because we love each other. Anyone who does not love remains in death. Anyone who hates a brother or sister is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life resting in, the, in him. So the way you know which group of people you belong to, whether you're the group of people that has that deep heart, head assurance that you belong to God, that all is well no matter what, or whether you don't, is this test. We know because we love each other. Now, Charlie Brown had problems with that. Once again, we've skipped the, to the wrong slide, please, Andrew. Thanks. Charlie Brown says, I love mankind. It's people I can't stand. <laughs> and, and we might identify with that from time to time. But you see, Charlie Brown's got it really, really wrong, hasn't he? He's, it's the people he's got to love. Because that's how you know whether you're a born or again saved person or not because you love that's how you know so you can't be on Charlie Brown's team it doesn't work and what is that kind of love well is it easy no no it's not it's being loyal when you don't feel like it it's being generous when you wish you didn't have to it's um, being kind and sensitive and listening when you've got other things on your mind it's seeking the best for the other person at whatever inconvenience to you may happen. That kind of love. And it's hard. No wonder Charlie Brown struggled with this, and some of us will struggle with it from time to time. But notice Charlie Brown says, I. He's, I. We'll, we'll come back to why that doesn't work in a minute. So... John takes us a little bit further and says everybody's going to have a moment of doubt. Most people will have had moments of doubt. Perhaps you haven't, but really most Christians have moments when they, they wonder, is it all real? Is the Bible true? Am I really saved? John looks at those moments of doubt here. This is how we know that we belong to the truth and how we set our hearts at rest in his presence by loving and then he goes on to say but this is a big but it's not there but it should be but if our hearts condemn us if our hearts condemn us we know that God is greater than our hearts and he knows everything and dear friends if our hearts do not condemn us we have confidence before God and receive from him anything we ask because we keep his commands and do what pleases him so, there are two reasons that we'll see here. I'm going to skip a slide. There are two reasons for those doubts. There's our hearts condemning us. That's kind of hidden sin. It's, it's the, um, you know, the, the flash of irritation, the, the moment of selfishness that other people might not see but which we feel in our hearts because we've been born again and our hearts are sensitive to that. So these are two reasons for doubts. A condemning heart or imperfect obedience. It was hard to think of a picture to show imperfect obedience or obvious sin, but I've got a, a guy here who's obviously not being very loving, is he? 
So there are two reasons for doubt. But look what John says to encourage us. God is greater than our hearts and he knows everything. And in fact he's just been arguing that if your hearts do condemn you, then it's really evidence that you are a Christian, that you are saved. If your heart condemns you, then it shows that you want to be more like him. And wanting to be more like him is evidence that you're saved. So there are two ways we can know, two ways we can have assurance that we really are saved, that we really are a Christian, that all is well no matter what. Two ways. God is greater than our hearts, so don't let those black thoughts and black moods persuade you otherwise. If you're feeling that you need to be more like Christ, then that's evidence that you are saved in itself. And the second way is because we keep his commands. We do what pleases him. And we talked last week about Christian obedience. So I'm going to jump again. There are two things that we must do. Two things that shows us what that kind of assurance looks like in the life of a Christian. And this is his command to believe. That's one thing that we must do. We must believe in the name of his son Jesus Christ. And we talked two weeks ago about how that was kind of a bucket idea that contains lots of ideas about the, the coming Messiah and the fact that Jesus was crucified and rose again and now rules and so on, that bucket idea when he says believe in the name of his son. And the second thing we must do is love one another. See love's not an optional extra. It's not something we can do today and not tomorrow if we don't like it. It's not an optional extra. It's something that we, that we must do. And look at the bit in black on the bottom. The one who keeps God's commands lives in him and he in them. And this is how we know that he lives in us. We know it by the spirit he gave us. So John's opening up a, a bit of a whole new idea here saying that God's Holy Spirit works in your life, that it's a spirit who gives you assurance, that it's a spirit who confirms in your life that you are a child of God. And I wanted to leave you with a, a, an image to take away for those of, of, of us who like pictures. Here it is. It's said that we, we fill our lives with the love of God, we receive the love of God as a man fills a little drinking glass at a waterfall. That's a picture of the lavish love of God. That hymn really wants to be sung, doesn't it? I think we better do that. Let me pray as the band comes up. Heavenly Father, thank you that you love us lavishly. Thank you that we can be assured that we are yours no matter what. Thank you that you are such a very great God. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Oh, thank you, Susan. And would you stand with us now as we sing our last song, How Great Is Our God?